Frederick Jackson Turner, a geographer turned historian, is best known for the frontier thesis. This is accepted as one of the turning points in American historiography, explaining American history and culture. Frederick Jackson Turner was born in Frontier, Wisconsin and educated at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. He did his graduation at Johns Hopkins University under Herbert Baxter Adams. He was one of the first historians professionally trained in the United States rather than in Europe. Turner started his teaching career at the University of Wisconsin in 1889. He made his mark with his very first professional paper, The Significance of History, 1891, which contains the famous line, Each age writes the history of the past anew with reference to the conditions uppermost in its own time. Frederick Jackson Turner should be counted among the progressive historians, though with the political temperament of a small-town Midwesterner, his progressivism was rather timid. Nevertheless, he made it clear that his historical writing was shaped by a contemporary agenda. The frontier itself we can see from outside was certainly something which was distinctive about the United States. As Turner was later to point out, there are probably certain major geographical points uh, where the frontier was always to be noticed, uh, points which acted as a bar, as a hindrance to further settlement or further movement uh, around which uh, frontiersmen, whether they be trappers or whether they be miners, tended to cluster before proceeding further. These geographic points were the Allegheny Mountains, the Mississippi River, the Missouri River, and finally the Rocky Mountains in the West. But this is to reduce the frontier to something very simple and geographic. The frontier was normally considered to be more than a geographic uh, line determined by a river or a mountain. It was the point up to which community settlement took place. It was the point beyond which individuals, whether, as I said, they were trappers, miners, cowmen or farmers, could proceed in order to create an individual life for themselves. In 1890, the Census Bureau of the United States declared that the line that was traditionally regarded as the frontier, it was a specific official term, no longer existed. The frontier had ceased to be as far as officials were concerned. Frederick Jackson Turner considered this an extremely disturbing development. Even though the official statement had not received enormous discussion, widespread um, uh, debate, Turner pointed to it as being a moment of reckoning, a time when Americans had to realize that one of the most decisive features which had made them a people had ceased to exist on the landscape of the United States. As a consequence, he wrote a, an essay which is uh, called the Turner Thesis and which uh, has attracted uh, both critics as well as supporters. Turner presented his epoch-making work, The Frontier in American History, before the Historical Association in Chicago in 1893. <laughs> What does he argue in this thesis? Well, I would put it as follows, which is that first and foremost, Turner asserts a basic hypothesis, which is that people come to the United States bound by certain communities. Some are religious communities, some are ethnic communities, not necessarily national, 
in the sense that nations did not always exist in the 18th and 19th centuries. But once they came to the country which is called the United States, they may have had an initial community experience associated with their own brethren who had preceded them. But then they proceeded also to experience something else, which is that in acquiring free land, in acquiring a space which was independent of their community, they had frequently to deal with nature in the raw. They had to deal with experiences where they counted not as a group, but as persons. At each of the frontiers, there was an opportunity given to people to exercise this choice. And as a result, there was a systematic breakdown over time, over the 18th and 19th centuries, of the experience of community. People would leave, people would adapt to new, to new circumstances, and then those very same people would frequently carry that new experience to another frontier and break it down still further. This habit of breaking things down, innovation, creation of an individual space, had been one of the most important markers which distinguished America from Europe, England from her colonies in the 18th century, and thereafter practically all communities that came, whether it be Germany or Eastern Europe or any other part of Europe. From this, he argued a series of points. He argued that within the United States, the experience of the frontier generated one, individualism and innovation. The experience of the frontier clearly was unique. It was unique to each person. He could not carry his community to the frontier to solve his problems. As a result, he had to innovate repeatedly. Though they were Democrats, they could develop their own individual taste according to their own temperament. They could all build their own lock cabins according to their own design, their own farmhouse, their own kind of agriculture, own kind of furniture, own kind of living that they liked. This was therefore a very individualistic society that had been born. And they had their corporate existence at the same time. The individual preferences could be actually implemented. And therefore, he thought that American individualism was also a product of the frontier. This has been possible because of opportunities in the West. Because of the opportunities, options that were open to the settlers, they could fashion their life according to their choice. This would not be uh, possible in a hidebound industrial society. So, because of the space, space is the main factor in Tarna thesis. Because of the space, a lot of uh, problems could be ironed out. And whatever one uh, wanted to do could be done on the frontier. So, this was the reason why he emphasized on this particular trade in their character that Americans were individualistic or American individualism was born on the frontier. Sir, if I may ask here, this concept of frontiers of opportunity, can we characterize this as a wheeled imperialism on the part of the Americans? Well, that is there, of course, because I had a mind to say that later on, that American, when the land frontier ended, then they thought of a naval frontier, and they gradually went on to global imperialism. So, frontier has no end, you know. And I have just said that they had now got to the star war and they sp through space research, they are landing on the moon. And why moon? They even want to land on Mars and if possible in Venus. So there is no end. The, the momentum that was generated by the ever-growing expansion into the frontier has not still been lost. So they went on and they had a sea front and they had a space front. Uh, I don't know what 
next front would come. The second point that he made is that at this frontier, many prejudices, distinctions between communities, break down. People have to deal with each other as individuals, not as members of one particular community or another. Sectionalism, communitarianism, the bane of European life, which actually prevents people from bonding, these factors were normally broken down in the case of the United States. Another formative experience, according to Turner. But in addition to this, Turner also pointed out that as a community, the frontier created something rather unique. It created responsibilities. Responsibilities which had to be put together and held by a national government. Hence, when you proceeded beyond the frontier, the government itself needed to decide how the movement beyond the frontier would take place. It had to provide improvements. It had to deal with methods of actually dispensing land. It had to deal with Native Americans. All of these were points at which there was a degree of interaction between individuals and government. So a national government was born as a result of the frontier. The frontier was not a place which only stimulated individualism, chaos and anarchy. It was also a place which stimulated responsibility and government in its own way. But it was a government which was democratic in character because it was formed on the basis of individuals who responded to the experience in their own unique personal ways. Hence, you have four major points which Turner argued, essentially, that innovation and individualism, breakdown of sectionalism, the creation of democracy, and finally, the creation of a sense of national responsibility. All these were central to the United States and all these were the product of the front. Many historians, particularly economic historians, they thought that it was too much of uh, exploration by space, too much of geographical exploration, and fundamental economic factors had been ignored. And the chief criti crit critic of Turner was Charles Beard. Charles and Mary Beard, this couple, had written The Rise of American Civilization in several volumes. And there, Beard was an economic historian. He believed in the germ theory. And later on, other economic historians followed suit, like Louis Hacker or William Faulkner, and other economic historians also uh, joined with uh, Beard's formulation that all American ideas which were claimed for the forest, for the frontier, were actually all there in the East. Later, the ideas spread to the West, not that they were born in the West, they simply spread from East to the West. Charles Beard particularly thought that this is all a process of extension of the existing idea of democracy, and he even went on to say that this democracy comes from England or France and they say that it is a continental democracy being carried over first to the eastern seaboard and then gradually on the great conveyor belt of westward expansion it went to the Rockies. So it was uh, an extension of the old idea of democracy, it was the extension of the old idea of nationalism, it was the extension of the old idea of individualism, liberalism, and also expansionism leading to global expansion. All these things, uh, you know, innovation is also, he thought, that was from borrowed from the old world. 
and borrowed from the eastern seaboard. So nothing new, he said nothing new was added by the frontier. Simply the old ideas rolled on. And he sees in this the play of capitalism. Beard, also Hacker and Faulkner, they all believe that is simply a capitalism got expansion because of the space. So space is nothing but a conveyor belt. It is nothing but providing space for the existing ideas. So capitalism was in full play and because of the sp space and opportunities, it had sp spread to the West, it had become an all-American, a pan-American affair. Space is no theory, space is a provider, it's not a theory. So basically, we had thought it was this rise of capitalism, its conflict with labor. This is, it sounds very Marxist, it's almost like class struggle, but that's what he wanted to say, that because of this, American civilization had progressed in a different direction. When Beard in this way in 1920s replied to Turner, people thought that, uh, of course he admitted one thing, that agrarian character of course was contribution. How do I as an histori American historian feel from the Indian point of view where the truth lies? I have simply one formulation. This formulation is that it is well known that all these ideas were age only as old as the hill. Everyone knows that all most of these ideas generated from uh, Greece and Rome, then via France and England, they had come. So there is no use battling over them, saying that these are the germs which went over to the West and West had contributed nothing. The factor that Turner discovered this democracy, idea of democracy, idea of nationalism, idea of republicanism, uh, liberalism, materialism, innovation, whatever, they got their American character. America had to contribute to the world also. We can, as Indians, we can talk of Indian democracy, Indian constitution, Indian culture. Culture is total, but yet we say that our identity or distinctiveness as a culture is Indian culture or Indian brand of democracy. We can say that Indian brand of nationalism. Similarly, if one has to discover and interpret the American brand of democracy, American brand of federalism, American brand of nationalism, American brand of agrarian democracy, agrarianism, American brand of individualism, etc., then one has to turn to Turner. After the loss of the frontier, America was qualitatively changing in many of his ideas. Whatever Turner had depicted was valid till the loss of the frontier. But what happened as aftermath, then most of these ideas came to be adjusted or rejected. Like uh, we can say that America had to learn to adjust or perish. Opportunity was gone by the loss of the frontier. There are two ways to ration their resources or become imperialistic. America ch chose both ways. They rationed their resources. The entire movement known as progressive movement stemmed from this sense of the loss of the frontier. And we have this quiet deal from Theodore Roosevelt. We have new freedom from Woodrow Wilson. We have the new deal from Franklin Delano Roosevelt, all these had emerged from the sense of the loss of the frontier. Americans had understood that they had to share the loaf with others. So there has to be distributive justice and monster trusts must be busted. They understood that the gigantic monopolies that had been created since the days of the civil war could not be retained anymore. People would perish. They had no gate of escape to a frontier which is always there, but suddenly got lost. They had to adjust within themselves. And therefore, uh, ideas changed. What Tana had vouched for had changed. Now, it, they had a spot on um, and the, what you can call 
human rights. Human rights was one of the top political cards of the day. Then we have industrialism. Suddenly, industrialism uh, uh, got the better of agriculture in America. And industrial inventions came galore during this time because this is a question of survival. They had to invent, they had to set up big industries, not just big business, but big industries at the same time. All due to this consciousness that land was not to be had anymore. So they had to be, they had to multiply existing resources by machines. And that means industrialization. They had a very big industrial revolution, greater than the British Industrial Revolution. And there was so much of invention, all that. It's all from this sense of precariousness that they had lost the frontier. So that was there. So new dimensions of uh, progressivism, radicalism, human rights, inventive genius, industrialism, and again I go back to your idea, it, this imperialism. The other, other way around was to become an imperialist power. If you cannot multiply your own goods inside the country through industrialism, what next to do, do? You have to expand. You must expand or explode. That is the law of physics. And that was the beginning. In 1898, the Spanish-American War came. When America for the first time tasted blood, because Cuba was a very weak country, they quickly defeated Cuba and got possession of their territory and sugarcane plantations. That whetted their greed. They went into Hawaii, went to Samoa, they went into Philippines finally, established a colony of Philippines. There also they didn't stop. They went to the Far East, went to China and insisted on open door there. They went, Commodore Perry went to Japan and insisted on the opening of Japan. And America was the first country to enter Japan. In this way, we see that America had become a world power. And this is also an aftermath of the loss of the frontier. These things were not foreseen by Frederick Jackson Turner. If we really want to be sarcastic, we can say that his thesis was very parochial. He only talks of the bygone days, what happened before 1890. But he couldn't be futuristic, what happened after 1890. That is the limitation of his theory. Otherwise, it's an excellent work and explains a lot of American history that went before 1890. I conclude there.